QXR business as well as well as the foods FMCG business. So we are here to uh, deep dive into a couple of uh, insights as well as a couple of uh, details uh, from the panel. I'll I'll not get waiting. I will start with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with a generic uh, view that I would want to get from uh, Rahul on uh, how 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 is e-commerce really now shaping and turning around the industry? What's what are your views? So. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, everyone, uh, thanks for coming down also. I know it's a kind of dreary day outside, but let's try and see if we can give you some more information about what we think about. When we, when as ONDC, when we're looking at, uh, at uh, e-commerce, we're thinking about it as how do we enable more and more digital commerce. Now when Mithun was talking about some of those numbers, that is also very, very specific to primarily the upper echelon, so to speak, of the socio-economic structure in India. If you look at the entire uh, structure of digital commerce that takes place, it is only happening within, say, about 6% of India. Okay, That's about it. 6% of India is transacting to buy and sell something digitally. If you look at the businesses, that is a number of businesses online right now, it's anything between 1 to 3% only. Which basically means that I have a bunch of companies out there who are either not being able to put out their products or services onto the net so that they can be discovered. The first problem statement is always going to be about discovery. Now, when we look at those numbers and we say we are a 1.4 billion people strong country, and inside of this one country also, uh, we all strongly believe that India is not just one country as such. We have a multitude of little, little uh, segments inside of that. Primarily because of population, because of religion, because of states, because of languages, etc. So when I really and truly look at it, I am looking at not just the top 6% of India to be uh, opened out for digital commerce. Right? And all the different uh, incentive schemes or the different platforms so far have only gotten to the top 6% primarily for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one being that if you are an entity you have to actually uh, reach out to somebody uh, in the tier 1 cities etc. At that point in time it is easier for you to get to somebody in the tier 1 cities primarily because of customer acquisition costs and all. If you start looking at tier 2, tier 3, it becomes language is a barrier. Uh, what they need to actually do in personalizing their product set is also an issue. Because of which most of the platforms have not really gone down to tier 3, tier 4 or into the rest of India, what we would term as Bharat. We've stuck primarily to the tier 1, tier 2 cities. And again, proximity and number of people. Secondly, now, if they are in a particular area and you want to be able to uh, service these people with a certain set of products and services, that comes with a cost. Right? The moment there is a cost involved with it, then obviously the, the, return, the, the supply side of it is always going to be stuck on trying to say what type of products and services can I provide which will be at that premium-ish kind of model so that it will it'll, uh, it'll be something that the customer actually wants. Now the moment we are starting to look at that, you have already started to build out like a barrier and saying this is the type of people and hence these are the type of products and services that they need to buy. Clearest example, all of us sitting in this room right now are probably someone who will go in and uh, are well spoken, well educated, we have a good command over the English language, we are very very technologically savvy, we carry smartphones, we are able to transact digitally. Now when that comes into picture, that means that we are always going to be looking at certain sets of products and services only. Uh, analogy is, uh, we walk into a five star hotel and, uh, and uh, go and say I want a particular cup of tea. They'll give me a cup of tea, they'll charge me 500 rupees for it. We won't bat an eyelid and we'll walk away. Right? I will go down to a tier, tier down and I'll go to like a, uh, like a two star or a three star hotel. I'll get another tea. I will have to pay 200 rupees for it. 
I have a problem, I'll turn around to the guy and say, I don't like the tea, you need to be sold. And these are the only type of customers who can buy it. And because of that, we need to now change the mindset and say, I want to go lower. And lower, that is where ONDC is coming in, is we want to go down to 75% of India. If I want to go down lower, that means that the person on the street should be able to buy stuff digitally. Digital commerce is not something as only for what we are talking about, the top 6%. How do I take it down to 75% of India? That is the goal. So, Mithun, sorry I spoke a little bit, but when I look at the overall construct of e-commerce, the e-commerce side will not change the overall consumption pattern of India. It's not like the e-commerce space will grow so big and the overall consumption of India will grow up. No, it will shift. And the reasons why those shifts will happen are going to be not just because of costing. Costing is not the only parameter by which a customer is going to buy. Part of it is going to be trust. Very, very strongly it is going to be trust. Where am I getting the product? Do I trust who's sending me the product? Costing is a little bit. Delivery and convenience. But at the same point in time, we should not be expecting to say that the lower I go, but just because the product is 50 rupees or so, I should be expecting that massive scale of all the services that need to go with that to justify that at 500 rupees. All those services may also get scaled down. Why are we trying to put a digital spin around what would be a normal e-commerce transaction at the bottom of the tier? That is where I believe e-commerce will go. And that's why I say digital commerce. From a digital commerce also, it is not going to be only people, as I said, like us, who are using, uh, who are using uh, smartphones. Why are we looking at just smartphones? That is not the only way to access technology, is it? That is not the only way that I can be able to access what is happening in the world to buy and sell. Voice is going to be the next phase that we will look at. And voice alone associated with NLP. So I should be able to make a conversation and that will be able to pull it up. And that is where, by the way, uh, the, the entire India stack is also looking at. Uh, and, uh, and if you want, I can actually give you a key pointers around uh, the, the, digital, uh, the India stack also. But when I'm looking at it, I'm going to say voice associated to national language processing. So whether I'm turning around and using like a Bhashini system and saying, Mirko ye sorpe is isko bhej dijiye, ya ye sorpe ye merle ye ke IRSI CDC ki ticket aap yoke kar dijiye, it is going to go down to that. Next one is going to be personalization, which means regardless of what we believe that person wants, if we are not able to send this person and say, this is what you want to do, I'm not sure that a standard platform approach will work that I'll put up something, you see what you want. Maybe no, maybe it's going to be, can I suggest what you want? Use language to access it. And that's where digital commerce to me is going to go. Now one quick one, I know if you can do that in a minute. Uh, you know, I think the audience would like to know uh, on point this why we understand a little bit of it. What is How many of you know what is ONDC? How many of you think it is a platform? Okay. That, that answers. That so answers. you should, you should. Okay. So if I may step back half a step and give you the DPI story, right? The, the entire, uh, the digital public infrastructure story that we built out in India. And then I'll come to what is ONDC and why we've also been set up. Does that make sense? Um, how many of you have Aadhaar systems? Everybody, right? Okay. So when we started in about 2008 in India, we were one of the world's most unbanked countries. Less than 20% of India had some form of a bank account. Everybody's aware of that, right? And because of that, there were various issues. I mean, if I wanted to transfer uh, some kind of a government scheme to the farmer, it was practically impossible. Half of it would just get lost. In 2008 or so, when we did a, uh, I think, uh, 
an external entity came in and uh, advised India and said, oh, if you want to get to 75% bank in India, it's going to take you about 48 years or 49 years. Any guesses on how many years we did it in? Eight years. Okay. When we started this entire digital revolution and we said that uh, all the all the your local Kirana store, etc., etc., should be able to transact digitally, as in they should be able to make some kind of a transaction, they should be able to receive money. When we started that, we were told you need to have 60 odd million POS machines. And so the POS machine guys were like, we are not sure we can even produce that, we have no idea how we will deliver that, we have no idea how we will service that. Again, we changed the construct and made each of one of us sitting in this room, the machine, the, our cell phones became the POS machines. And the only thing we had to do was ensure that the local shops had to have a QR code. So we, rather than having expensive POS machines sitting there, we changed the construct. So what we are doing in India right now has never been done before in India. Sorry, in the world. Never. The world is now looking at India to figure out what is it that you're doing. Whether it was UPI, where we do about what, 10 billion transactions a month. We are looking at what, 1.3 or billion people in India right now carry Aadhaar cards. The speed at which we've done all of these things is primarily because of DPI. DPI is further broken up into four different segments, right? The first one was identity, which is why I asked, how many of you have Aadhaar cards? And practically everyone does. So the first element was identity. The second element to it was the DigiLocker schema, where we were saying consent and where is the data being stored. So because of the DigiLocker system, how many of you use DigiApra? Anybody's used the, uh, you know you can also lock your DigiApra, uh, sorry, your DigiLocker to get a passport? Took me 10 minutes to do that. Okay, so the second one, first one, identity. Second one, DigiLocker, which is around trying to store uh, credentials of an individual. The third one was around payments, which is why we have UPI. Again, the only place in the world and scaled to the level that it is there in India is UPI. I can actually move money from an individual, so P to P, the person to person or peer to peer, five seconds. Last leg of it, now, because we've been able to democratize out finance is why ONDC comes into the picture, which is where I'm looking at and saying, you know, now we need to democratize commerce. In the simplistic term, when I look at it, why were we brought out was because every different uh, vertical that you look at, any space, okay, any space only has one or two or maximum three platforms which control that entire segment. Think of it anyway, and I can guarantee that. And because of that, that has led to a certain concentration of power and concentration of the entire system of how things are done. What that means is from a seller's perspective, you have various issues, right? There is a certain amount of uh, margins that are uh, cut away. Uh, some of the margins we've heard are as high as 55% in the uh, restaurant business uh, and my august panel should be able to uh, verify validate that uh, as low as 28 percent but going all the way up to about 55 percent when i look at standard products the margins that are taken away by some of these platforms is about 40 percent second issue terms and conditions when i look at terms and conditions if the platform turns around and says you will get paid in 60 days you as a seller will get paid in 60 days you have a choice about it no. Right? If you need the money in three days, you're not getting it. The last one, and I'm trying to keep it short, is you have a disintermediation risk, which means that if the, if the platform likes your product, next thing you know, it's been white labeled and your entire market is practically gone. From a customer perspective, I have an issue of trust, which means that if, I, if you're trying to book an air ticket, you're going to go to multiple sites. You're trying to buy a, a refrigerator, again, you'll go to multiple sites. Why? If everything was available through one side, that should be easy. So where ONDC comes into the picture 
is to turn around and say, how can I make sure that a customer sitting on a particular buyer application is able to go and get it from a separate seller application? What that means is that, let's say we have, at this point in time, about 10 or 11 uh, buyer applications. Buyer applications are like ATM, PhonePay, MyStore, uh, and, and a whole host of Bitsila, etc., etc., right? Magic Pin and all. When anyone is going to turn on and go to any of these websites, we are, we are allowing each of these websites to become this, like a, like a super app. At this point in time, if I'm a, a uh, platform, I need to have seller engagements, I need to have seller on onboarding so that I can actually turn around and say, you know what, uh, let me, let me uh, have all of these arrangements so that I can actually buy a refrigerator, etc. And what a WNDC does is that you as a customer will go onto a buyer application and say, I want a refrigerator, I want air tickets, you want anything, you want to buy uh, a Namayatri uh, 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 ride hailing uh, in Bangalore, etc. That request goes to the ONDC gateway, and the gateway is the only thing that is ONDC. From here, we will take that request and send it to various seller applications, who are the ag actual aggregators of the different sellers in the backend. And all of these people will now respond back to you on your same buyer application itself. So you, as a customer, don't go anywhere else, and ONDC is just that one gateway, right? So all the information has come back to the buyer application. Buyer application now acts as your agent. You, as the customer, choose what is the product you want, how you want it delivered, etc. That product flows one way, money flows the other way. So, in essence, you, as the customer, go to a buyer application, and the seller goes to a different seller application, and the product flows so that you are you're, you're oblivious to where the product is necessarily coming from. But the major element for both sides is that data which is going to be the next oil is flowing to the other side so that the seller also has an ability to start doing some kind of analytics and start figuring out where they want to go. So think of an entire chain of that particular uh, transaction which is broken up. That is what ONDC does. Okay. So I'll be here for a while after this and I can always explain more. Okay, that's quite, uh, quite brief. Okay, great. So, so uh, I'll pick up a few of his words and I'll relate with consumer. But before that, uh, I mean, just think about consumer. Who is a consumer? We all sitting here are consumer. And we all use this uh, e-commerce platforms for our different, different reasons. That may be, like Mr. Rahul said, that that may be uh, related to ease, that may be trust, that may be, um, I mean, any, any good reason we are going for uh, e-platform. So that is something which is a must for uh, today's time. So, uh, I mean, I should not uh, uh, relate to that particular thing that what is the necessity, but I should relate that where the gap is still there, which as a consumer we all feel. Now, when uh, I consider myself as a consumer, so uh, today's time I feel time is more important to me as compared to money. I mean, if something can save my five minutes and if, if someone is asking, uh, 50 rupees extra for that, I'll be ready to do that. But I just wish that something can save my time. So that, that thing relates with food as well. I don't want to, I mean, involve so much in uh, cooking and other things. So I really wish to go for these ready to cook and ready to eat uh, packed items. Uh, and that's uh, what uh, this e-commerce is making it easy for me as far as the availability thing is concerned. But I'm more concerned about the trust factor because as soon as you buy a packet or as soon as you open a packet, so still that question always revolves in our mind that uh, whether should I trust that whatever the ingredients, whatever the uh, processing technology they said that this product has passed on through. So is, is, is it truly, I mean, can I trust? Um, like just a simple example, when we use the spices, so I still have that doubt that, okay, the powdered spices, should I use it? But because I don't have time, so I need to use that. And I always wish that somehow uh, lots of, I mean, ob obviously lots of uh, startups are coming up. So I just uh, wish that these startups, they can assure me that, okay, please believe our product, please believe us, whatever we are offering you, you can trust us. 
Uh, that's what, uh, I mean, at NIFTM, actually we, uh, I'm sorry, I'm from NIFTM University that is based at Kundi. It's under Minister of Food Processing. So at NIFTM, all uh, researchers, they work on such things that how can we create and how can we retain trust of uh, the same consumers towards uh, processed food products. In those lines, recently we worked on a blockchain-based uh, traceability product as well. So like when, uh, uh, I mean, Mr. Rahul uh, was telling, so this thing was coming to my mind that as a consumer, it's, it's perfectly fine that on an e-commerce platform, I can come to know that, okay, this is the seller. It's too convenient for me to check the seller, to check the ingredients, to decide which brand to go for. But again, the thing is, I really want to know that if they are saying that these spices are grown in Northeast, so they're truly grown in Northeast. Uh, so we did a project, I mean, uh, obviously MFPI funded that project and we worked on that, what is the need of this blockchain in uh, food processing industry and are the, I mean, is the industry ready and are the consumers ready? Um, I'll not go uh, deep into that, but the thing is, industry is ready. But again, the question is, are consumers ready to pay extra for that? We, we all call for trust, but if I say that, okay, my, the spices is blockchain enabled, I can, I mean, you as a consumer can scan that. There's a difference between digital traceability and blockchain traceability. So I'm talking, I'm not talking about a simple QR code scanning, which is there uh, nowadays on majority of products. So they call that you can just uh, trace that, I mean, scan that QR code and you can just uh, trace the origin. Now here the question is, when we trace that QR code and we just try to know about the complete supply chain that product has uh, went through, still that question of trust remains as such because the data can be manipulated because we are entering the data at majority of the places manually. So this uh, blockchain can help us in that particular aspect because here the data cannot be manipulated. It's completely, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's not manual. So you are using your IoT tools and you are taking help of AI to get the data entered and then a consumer can trust that. But again, from that particular project, the question which remains unanswered is how many consumers are still ready to pay extra for that? So if I'm saying my product is uh, blockchain based, so can you pay 100 rupees, 150 rupees extra? Because my point is why should in industry invest on something? Unless either the government makes that particular thing compulsory or the consumer is uh, demanding for that. After this post-COVID uh, uh, scenario, Europe has made it mandatory for uh, their uh, products to be digitally traced. So, uh, I mean, something of that sort of thing can come. So, I believe consumer, that's what I hope I answered the question. Consumer looks for these things, but again, the thing is this uh, consumer industry academia. This, this matching needs to be proper so that research can be carried out in the same direction. Industry can do that and then consumer should be ready to accept that so that Industry person should not feel that where to find the margins out of that particular thing. So, thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Anupama. Uh, in the world, there was uh, a whole boom about um, ordering food on demand on a mobile app. And I think that's how Fresh News idea also came about that India was also seeing a surge in smartphones available. Uh, food and food brands, per se, India really had nothing. US, back in 2013, I remember there were 100 plus brands doing 500 million plus revenue and India did not even have one. I think Domino's uh, was still smaller than 500 million. So I think there is a dearth of food brands, uh, be it QSR or any format of food brands, restaurant chains, etc. And that's how Fresh Menu as a concept, uh, we, uh, and obviously the blue sky thinking was that people will stop cooking at home, kitchens will be dead. And I remember some of those were the early things we said. I don't think that's happening, but a shift to convenience. Um, at the moment when I can't go to a restaurant, when I can't go where good food is available, can the good food come to me is the genesis of how cloud kitchen industry came about. Uh, and I remember when we started, it was not even called the cloud kitchen industry. Now we've become a vertical in the whole F&B space. Um, I think food delivery in India um, has grown a lot. Uh, uh, we started back in 2014. Uh, there has been a lot of growth, but I think it is still way smaller than even what happens in Southeast Asia, what happens in China. Uh, we are way behind what are the numbers in Brazil. So I feel there is a lot of room for growth, a lot of future for us to grow. There is still a lot of friction that we need to solve. Um, ONDC is something that all of us are really looking at in how it can expand what this industry can achieve. 
Um, so I think there is a lot more to play out, and especially from consumer expectation, uh, supporting the economics, uh, platforms, frequency. There are a lot of answers to still reach to a point where it becomes very, very sustainable. Sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Rashmi. Uh, we may jump to you. Thank you. Good morning to everyone, and uh, very interesting to hear uh, my fellow panelists speak also. Especially gratifying to know the professor speaking about how does the industry get confidence that it will make margins. I think truly they are thinking from the other person's uh, perspective, and I think that kind of collaboration is uh, probably needed. Uh, uh, to me, the, the topic is importance of e-commerce in food processing. Uh, I give a brief introduction about what we do and then I will tell you this. Uh, I am from Wayfold Foods. We are a soil to say company. We are, uh, the company's objective, let me put it this way, is to how do we minimize the waste in the entire value chain right from soil to say and uh, create a formal uh, entity which kind of uh, can work in an organized way uh, along the entire supply chain. We have different units. There is a farm focused unit called focused on farm productivity improvements, uh, waste reduction at the farm, etc. This is called our group. We have our own brands and we also have facilities like contract manufacturing units and private labeling facilities which enable others to launch the brands and scale their brands, etc. And we also have technology products working at each end of the supply chain. So when you look at e-commerce, for me the interpretation is any food product we consume, it takes between 7 to 12 steps before it reaches the consumer from the farmer. The farmer sells it to an aggregator, the, it could be an FPO also. From the aggregator it goes to a processor. From a processor, processor it's like a miller, he makes two dal over two. From the miller it goes to a, maybe a brand where they process it and make it into processed products etc. Or as a whole product, it will, it will go directly into the distributor or the wholesaler. And there are multiple semi-wholesaler uh, levels, etc. before it reaches retailer and then the end consumer. Roughly across fresh grocery and processed products, we can safely say that there are at least 8-9 levels. Now, this is a product which is perishable by nature. In fresh products, it's probably one uh, a day or two. In, uh, uh, in processed products, it probably extends to like 6 months. But end of the day, it is perishable. Now, how can digital technology enable this to become better? That is the role of e-commerce. It is not, while well, it is to a large extent the consumer ordering from uh, a storefront, digital storefront, it is also about what digital technology can do at each step. How can the farmer sell better to the FPO? How can an FPO get connected better to a processor? At each of these steps, this digital technology provides us discoverability, so the entire platform uh, increases in size. It also provides uh, reliability. Okay, if I order, I will get. That is extremely important when we make a shift from one thing to another. So today we go to the metro. Metro is taken for granted because it, you know it comes on time. Just like that, this is another channel which provides reliability and consistency. That's the third. If we do this repeatedly over and over again, then people will automatically shift to a, a platform which provides. Uh, better discoverability, which leads to better pricing, etc., and uh, better and uh, reliable service as well. So to me, these are the three things which digital technology brings in. And there are various companies kind of doing work to improve these trends. I think OMPC is doing this LR job, but I mean, they're kind of organizing the whole ecosystem, etc. There are a lot of work which is happening from entrepreneurs on food products, etc. Uh, in food specifically, this is about, this is our view on what how digital commerce kind of uh, can help the food processing sector by eliminating waste at each level. In food specifically, there are a few points I wanted to make. Because the India as a country is a huge sector in food. Not just it is, it is the sector huge, it is also very diverse. The food preferences across any table will be very, very different. We know that even within the family there are such diverse preferences. Now, for such kind of diverse preferences, a digital storefront is a goal. Because the inventory costs are much lower, the discoverability is easier, etc. And uh, it is not that these kind of things don't exist. I mean, a couple of instances I just want to take. Uh, one of my friends works, he's from Ariyalu, it's a district in Tamil Nadu. He works in Pune. Whenever he goes back, his entire flat community makes him buy uh, cashews from that place because they like it. And every time he has to carry a couple of cases. Right? We know that abroad, whoever goes, it carries suitcases of like spice powders, 
said that, right? Uh, I visited a retail in Kool, probably closer to your place like this. He says that very good spices you will get there. He also has a available on phone to any part in India. What he does is he gets the order on phone, maybe three, four months, once people will order. He will go to the next post office and then just send it to the post. What digital commerce does is essentially formalizing this so that it can be done at scale and make it easier for a lot of people to actually like, uh, come in. So uh, I, I think uh, di digital is a channel which is uh, in a sector which is as diverse as uh, food processing and the food consumption. I think it's a, uh, it's, a good, it's a good channel to kind of you know, unlock the potential which is available and it can coexist with uh, the existing channels. Great. Thanks, thanks, Nish. Rashmi, uh, on to you. Uh, it's, it's good to understand how do you really build customer experience with what you are doing right now, especially when you're not really meeting consumers face to face uh, directly, like a restaurant where you know you have a experience and uh, you, you know the restaurant can meet a consumer face to face. How do you do that? How do you enhance that experience? Um. I think some of the stuff that works in our favor uh, compared to a restaurant is um, each step data is selected. So we know what consumers are choosing on the menu, uh, what they dropped off the cart, what they added to cart, what are they repeating more frequently, um, what time of the day or what uh, localities, what are the ordering patterns. So the data at the last mile available in terms of control on your order like how much time you took to prepare the order, how much time it took to reach the customer, um, and what is the feedback that you got on that order. Feedback cycle is uh, usually one for a lot of people less than two hours. Mostly within a week, you would have collected a large part of the feedback for the work that you're doing. So compared to physical restaurants, uh, this is a far more data-backed operation, and that allows this business to optimize customer experience better. You can plan and forecast a lot more because you have historical data on which days of the week, what price point, what offers, how many orders you can get. So I think that plays a huge part in terms of uh, consumer experience. The other thing that people like us had to really work on was packaging of the product. Um, India had no food delivery ecosystem and packaging the food, what kind of menus can be packaged, what kind of food can travel 5 kilometers on the road what kind of food tastes good uh, one hour post preparation. So there has been a lot of iteration in products and fitting those products in packaging units. Also finding spill proof packaging, um, consumer trust, especially post COVID for example, putting a bag and a seal on top of an order. So there have been multiple steps, but I think data is a big backbone for uh, building consumer experience here. Sure, thanks, thanks Rashmi. On, on to Rahul, uh, if you can keep it brief again. <laughs> What everybody has said, I completely wholeheartedly agree and I'm going to push my fellow panelists to think a little, go down a couple of levels also, right? What we are still talking about is almost what I would term as first world problems. It has to be packaged, it has to be delivered, but everybody is thinking about it as having to do it themselves. That is not the objective. If you are really, the, the easiest and the only way to unlock potential as Anupama, uh, as Anupama was also talking about, as well as Rashmi was also talking about, is to remove friction. Which means that how do I make it easier for discovery? How do I make it easier for uh, that transaction? How do I make it easier for delivery? How do I make it easier for trust as a whole? And trust, I'll, I can talk about also. But when I look at it and say that reach, if I'm going to look at it and say, I'm building everything by myself, then reach is always going to be a problem. If I'm based in Bangalore, I will try and find my local area because that is closer for me. So I will have to build out my entire construct around that one particular area. Where. However, if I'm a Kanjivaram Sari uh, manufacturer or as, uh, as sir, you were, Vignesh, you were talking about the, the cashew nuts, right? Why is it that somebody sitting in uh, somewhere in the east cannot get it? It's the same product. And if the product has a, life, uh, has a shelf life of six months, whether it takes two days to deliver or it takes four days to deliver, it shouldn't matter. So the primary thing is always going to be around reach. For reach, the first thing that comes into play is going to be discoverability, which means that 
don't try and do everything on your own so if there are there is a buyer application who's really good at doing customer acquisition then you base everything on that if you're really good at delivery then you base everything on that you do that one thing or multiple things really well you plug that into the chain so what that means is that let's say we have phone pay paytm etc as our buyer application they are doing a great job of doing customer acquisition in tier 2 tier 3 cities and if you as a brand cannot get to that city why do you want to try and build an entire network so that you are going to be able to do that uh, do, do deliveries there etc the moment you start doing that it becomes expensive and that cost you then you can move on to a particular customer who may not be willing to pay for it okay now customer acquisition is done you figured out you can create a product now i want to have a product picked up and delivered all the way out somewhere to uh, the north of india from the south of india why do you have to worry about setting up the entire chain of delivery also find somebody else within the network who's willing to take on that uh, that delivery so like for example uh, from an ondc perspective we've got ship rocket we've got danzo etc etc and ship rocket for example is also tied up with uh, india post believe it or not we only have about 20 21000 zip codes in india but the ability to pick up and drop from anywhere doesn't exist outside of like an india post kind of environment so you make the product you package it any which way you want to or go get somebody else to package it also for you deliver give it to the india post person for example and they deliver it money flow will take place here away so reach is not dependent on you having to do everything from a d to c perspective reach you don't worry about you build you build your product let the reach be developed out by somebody else on the eco chain okay the second cycle is trust as uh dashi you were also talking about right that and and uh, you were also talking about saying that how do i actually trust that the product is right that is built out on multiple levels firstly there has got to be some kind of a network wide scoring component to it there has got to be a product quality set to it there has to be an effective way that the customer no matter what what your uh, what your ecosystem level is so for example if you're in the top 6% or you're in the bottom 50% or whichever way everybody wants what you are paying for to come to you and when you say what i'm paying for that means the right product is something okay now whether i'm buying spices at 100 rupees or i'm buying spices at 20 rupees i want a value for that one so traceability trackability quality etc are very very important now from a reach perspective if somebody else has figured out a particular segment you are getting an order you should be able to get it that is the domestic side now from an international side but also india uh, so uh, otc is also just launched out uh, the 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 b2b uh, export side and we are working quickly also towards the b2c side there is a money flow thing that we are also looking at but the idea is somebody sitting in dubai should be able to order kanchivaram sarees or buy spices from india why not they can be delivered the glitch is always going to be of the importing country right there will be certain restrictions that the importing country has now from an importing country perspective it, we just have to work together on building that eco chain so that somebody sitting there is saying i want this product and yes it is legal for this country to be sending this particular product on in the indian uh, shores perspective the idea is how do we build that chain so that the customer so the 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 seller of that particular product will work with the cha or the delivery partner and provide them with the documents so that the product flow can take place and then obviously the reverse flow of money and we have to work on that entirely but yes all of these are work in progress but very quickly we have about a thousand person hours of work going into ondc on a daily basis okay so rest assured we will build that eco chain and we will not be the concentration of power we are not the ones who are going to turn around and say you will do it like this there are various ways to do it we have no one to tell each of the different people on this is the way that you have to do it we will only put out and say this is one of the ways that we are thinking about it you tell me how you want it done we will enable that 
Who am I to tell you what? You've been doing a business very, very successfully for a period of time, right? My job is to enable you to do it better. And that's all I'm here for. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, I think we're running out of time, but uh, I will... Uh... A few uh, areas. One area is related to the sustainability concept. Now, as a consumer, if I'm... Uh, J just a very simple example, I'm organizing a party at my house and the food is left. Now, I just really look for someone to please help me in making that leftover food reach to the needy people. And uh, that's what, uh, there are lots of social e-commerce platforms and apps are also coming up. So that's what I feel that if, if startups can think of uh, working more towards this particular direction, so this can be one good area, which uh, at least our research is bringing that out. Uh, second is related to this, uh, because nowadays startups are coming up, I mean, uh, if I'm good at research, so I'll start a food startup because I'm too good into that. Maybe I'll start up a, a, a millet-based, uh, maybe a bakery item company. But I'm not too good at the delivery front or maybe I'm not having that particular expertise. So I'll uh, uh, take help of any outsourcing company or maybe a 3PL. Now that's where also I feel as a consumer we are looking uh, for, uh, for some change. Uh, because you know when that delivery person is coming, so the way he treats the consumer, uh, in one way your company's image is also going in that particular direction. Just an example, if I've ordered something from Zomato and the delivery person is making a call and it's like, ma'am, jaldi bahar aao, mein bahut late ho raho, second order bhi delay ho and I need to rush through. I'll, I'll feel like, Are Baba, he is in such an urgency, Zomato ko chhoke kahin aur se order karein kya? But again, at, at every place the thing is like that. Vaise, I'm really thankful to Zomato because they are the only, uh, I mean, uh, the e-commerce platform who are making delivery at Neptune right now. So at least we are thankful that we are getting the product. <laughs> So just an example, I am just uh, want you to uh, think on those lines that when we are connecting with someone as our, uh, as our uh, uh, outsourcing agency, so we need to be very particular about how that company also uh, takes the image and uh, those people need to be trained enough. This is the third area, the training, the, the grooming of our people. Because in food industry, that is what something really important is. And that's what e-commerce is actually covering up a lot of things. Because when we physically go to any stores, the visual thing impacts a lot. But in, when we are buying anything through e-commerce, so that visual thing is losing front as far as the production areas are concerned. But that is somewhere I feel that uh, the consumer would really I mean, uh, be happy if we can have a feel of that. Uh, the AR and the VR thing, that's what uh, nowadays it's going on very nicely in garments, in furniture. So if something can be done about this uh, augmented and virtual reality in case of food also. Uh, recently I was going through an app which was giving me uh, this option that okay, we have lots of food items and we can help you in picking up the food items uh, with the help of this, uh, I mean, your, your, your diet preferences. It's something sort of a customized diet plan. So you can just, we can just frame up a quick diet plan for you and then you can pick up the products from our app. So this is also something which, and the last thing uh, which I wish to talk about is this reverse logistics things and which also I feel that in food industry, e-commerce can fill a gap because that is also somewhere. I mean, in, in food, there are a lot of wastages which we just feel that it's not going to harm the environment. But that is unknowingly or knowingly is harming. So. Uh, reverse logistics with the help of e-commerce can do wonders for this particular industry which can be of help for <coughs> all of us. So, thank you. No, thanks. I think uh, Rashmi Neftum is an uh, area which we can also So, yeah. 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 Okay, great. So, we are running out of time. So, we will uh, have an open session if uh, there are any specific questions to the panel or to me. Uh, happy to you. addition you are doing to uh, attract the buyers and sellers onto the platform. What is your USP so that you can bring in more buyers and sellers? Right? You are, you are, there is no, at this point of time there is no USP, there is no major value addition. Why do you think buyers and sellers will come onto the platform? If you think that they will come onto the platform, how long will you take for the majority of the people to come onto the platform? Sure sir. So sir, uh, let me reiterate first. So please, Think of it like this, right? If this is a standard platform word, 
where I have a buy side and I have a sell side. So far, that was what was the standard norm, right? You have to have any platform. You look at it. There is a standard buy side, which is where the customer goes to. Okay, but it's been a platform approach. What ONDC has done is just broken it up and taken it apart. For hard, where ONDC is acting as the gateway or the routing service. So when the customer is going to come, the customer is going to come to any buyer application. Now, uh, and that request is going to go to the ONDC gateway. Gateway will now send it to various seller side applications, right? Which is from a platform, various seller sides. So the first value unlock is where everything had to be done by that particular platform. It breaks it up and allows the customer to come to one side but have access to multiple seller sides. The second part of it is where because of the unlock that we've done, it allows for various different services to be incorporated. Again, not something that each platform has to do. So for example, if you bought a particular product from one seller application, you can now buy delivery services from a different seller application which may be able to provide this at a cheaper and a faster rate. Why should your product be coming from 200 kilometers away when it could be coming to you from two kilometers away outside your colony itself? That is the first thing. The second part, sir, is that when you look at how long would it be, right? It, uh, when we started in March, uh, sorry, when, when we were looking at transaction volumes in uh, January of this year, we were doing some 50 odd transactions per day. By March, we were doing 50,000 transactions per day. At this point in time, we do about 1.5 lakh transactions per day. Now, and across a varied set, okay, whether it is uh, whether it is ride hailing and you are able to uh, book uh, a, uh, uh, an auto in uh, an auto in Bangalore, or you are able to buy food, or you are able to buy electronics or fashion or anything, it is right now possible. Which leads to the next one. Why is it that if, for example, I am sick and you want to send some soup over to me, this, this, this is the problem. I, in the present platform world, you would only be able to go to one place and buy a soup, have it delivered to me. At the same point in time, now you have to go to a different platform to say, I want to send flowers also because you want to make sure that I feel a little better, excited. Can you do that? You have to go to two different platforms, right? So the second unlock that happens is that through one buying application itself, you will be able to do adjacencies, etc. also. So you've got food also, you've got flowers also, you've got delivery services also. <coughs> Everything which is now optimized to deliver and pick up from the nearest point. So from a sustainability perspective, my product is no longer coming from 200 kilometers or 20 kilometers, it is coming from 2 kilometers. Okay? From a sustainability perspective, I'm using less fuel. From a sustainability perspective, I am not paying out so much margin to a platform which is a rent-seeking model, but I am now giving more money and sustaining that one business also. In the food industry, for example, the, the amount of payouts as I was discussing earlier could be anything from 28% to 55%. Now in the entire chain, from a ONDC perspective, where ONDC does it, it is only the uh, DPI is sitting in the middle, right? We don't charge it for it. But the buyer app, seller app, I think they're charging less than 8%. So it allows for more money to go into the pockets of the people who actually require it. And not be there only to pay the platform so that they can just take a food. Does that answer your question, sir? Thank you, sir. Great. So uh, <coughs> we'll, uh, we need to. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you.